So I guess I'm going to try filling in uh, the arrows in Brian's slides. Um, so what do we do between you know that wonderful first hit or like a docking list, and then um, does the mic work or? Um, and then how do we get to the biology of things? Um, so for this, I'm actually, because I knew there was going to be two uh, GPCR talks today, I actually chose a different system uh, that I actually work on. And it is the um, trying to design inhibitors for lysine demethylatases um, as a potential target, a therapeutic target for prostate cancer. So I think we can kind of step back and for each of our projects, we almost have four different steps in the lab, so sort of four different categories. Uh, we identify a problem. A lot of the time, it's a biological problem. Uh, for example, here, can we find inhibitors for epigenetic targets um, and that are involved in prostate cancer? A lot of the time, we have certain sub-questions that we want to answer as well in these. Um, but we try to choose a biological system because then we can, at the end, do experimental testing. So for this, in this case, we're, we're actually looking also at fragments. And can we actually find fragments uh, as initial leads, um, sorry, um, that are um, uh, fragments that are, are initial leads that would be subtype specific. So this is sort of like a hidden problem, even though we're asking a bigger biological question. Uh, then what we do is we find our um, uh, uh, receptor, so example, a protein target. We do retrospective analysis, which is trying to uh, optimize the system. Um, next, we go with uh, prospective docking. So we dock huge libraries. In this case, it's a fragment, li fragment library. And then we try to, uh, with expert opinion, which would be me or a chemist or a biologist as well, which whom we interact with, uh, try to pick and identify lead compounds. And finally, we go for testing, experimental testing. And that includes a logical testing, such as assays, um, going back and validating some of our doc docking poses with x-ray crystallography, and then doing structure-based um, analysis and a development of our uh, compounds as well. So it's sort of like a back and forth. And so how do we do that in, this lab, in our lab? So in this case, um, the question and sort of the problem we were trying to look at was um, prostate cancer. And we know, of course, you know, we always start with like statistics and why is this important. Uh, so we have about 220 cases of prostate cancer, um, ident uh, sort of new cases that are uh, diagnosed each year in the US. And there are um, approximately just under 30,000 deaths. And these deaths to prostate cancer are attributed to uh, the emergence of aggressive prostate cancer phenotypes. And there are common drugs that are given to these patients. And here's sort of um, examples. I don't want you to get anything out of it, uh, I guess, except that the survival rates aren't that great on these therapies. So what do these therapies hit if we're trying to identify a new target, but something that we can have help biology with and still answer our questions? So we look at, first we look at the biology. So we know that um, for these aggressive forms of cancer, the, the pathway that is actually being um, sort of uh, hijacked by the cells is the uh, adrenal receptor. Um, and basically, this receptor can bind a hormone. It's translocated into the nucleus and then opens up, um, tries, uh, starts uh, turning on genes such as PSA, which cause cell proliferation. Um, these are the two sort of different uh, drugs that are used currently on the market. Uh, one that would stop the, um, inhibit the testosterone biosynthesis. And the other one actually that is a, um, antagonist for the receptor itself. But are there pathways somewhere near here or other enzymes that do have influence on this? And of course there is. And this is sort of the target of our um, uh, docking campaign in, this in here. So here we have a new target, which would be the KDM uh, for demethylates, which is actually related to just what I was talking about, the turning on of proliferation genes for cancer. This enzyme actually uh, is able to take um, so I don't know if you know, like there we have histones in, in, our, uh, in our nucleus and these histones have DNA wrapped around them. And when it's wrapped around these histones, it's off. So when we have these lysines, especially lysine 9, methylated, it tells the genes to wrap around these histones and they cannot sort of transcribe certain genes. However, um, once this enzyme comes along, takes off um, some of the methylation marks, oops, the methylation does not work. So it takes off one methyl here to make it a dimethylated li uh, lysine. It is able to open up DNA. And what does it open up? It actually opens up the DNA that the adrenal receptor can sit on 
and transcribed genes. So if we can find inhibitors for this pathway, we could maybe use it as a double therapy in the future. So is this uh, sort of possible sort of pathway to go after? Yes, it is. Um, there are uh, inhibitors for the KDM demethylases. They're unfortunately not very specific when they hit KDM4C, so can we find new ones that are? And there are sort of clinical programs against other uh, demethylases available, so this may be a good idea to go for. So this is then, um, this is where how we began with a question and sort of biology that we can later test. Uh, test. So how do we identify new selective inhibitors for KDM4? And I think this is sort of mainly the slide that you usually see when uh, you know, we go and sort of Brian shows you the big picture, you have sort of you know, what, how we prepare, how many fragments we dock, and then we show you the main compound, uh, which is active in the end. But so how did we do this? How did we uh, select from the library of 600 uh, after we had a doc, docking rank list, the 14 compounds that were later on tested in vivo that gave you us the seven hits um, that later on were optimized uh, based on the structure and showed selectivity. So the first thing we do, is said we look, take our uh, active site if we know where, you know, we try to dock to, and we try to do sort of like a retrospective analysis. We try to dock known compounds into the site and see how well they fit. Um, this requires a lot of like, you know, the biology we talked about, a lot of reading too, and sort of seeing if we're hitting key residues. We know from, from other inhibitors that hitting this lysine tyrosine pair and making a hydro, uh, hydrogen bonding here is very important. We also know that there's a metal in the active site, so we want to have that also sort of being chelated. So we do this with, this is sort of just a sample of three, three compounds, but there's more knowns. Uh, this is a very known, uh, known uh, uh, pan-specific sort of, because all the uh, lysine demethylases compound inhibitor, and we try to dock it. And then we look at enrichment plots, and depending on how we optimize the site, we can increase our enrichment plots and see how well we dock towards it. Of course, um, so then we have our, little s our site, we dock our compounds, so for each uh, compound, you might have, you know, we talk about these zinc libraries. Um, this is a library of just fragments, and this was done a couple years ago, so it was only 600 fragments, 600,000 fra fragments, sorry, um, which have very good sort of statistics. They're like, you know, um, small, um, very hydrophilic compounds. Um, for each compound, we sort of pre-generate all the different conformations, and I'm not sure if you are aware of it, so the docking actually goes pretty quickly once we have the zinc library ready to go. And then all of these compounds are then sort of put into our grids um, and then scored. Some of them bump out automatically and others, um, based on this equation, are ordered in our list. So here, for example, would be the first compound that showed it up in our top uh, Docking list, so do we keep it, do we not keep it? And then now that's where the expert sort of information comes in. So um, I guess I should take a step back um, and say that for, for each list we look about, uh, for each docking list, we look about 0.5 to 1% of the um, compounds. We actually visually inspect them. Um, for How like. Do you take to do that? Hmm? How fast do you go through the um, It depends. So. This is going to be sort of, so one of the things that we do, so for, for example, we can automate it automatically filter down the list, but it takes a couple of days. You actually have to go and, you know, certain chemotypes you see, if I'm not familiar with it, I'll actually go into the CSD, um, look at the CSD. So the ha that's the database for people. Again, acronyms for different people. Um, I hate them myself. Um, we would look, sorry, we would look back into the crystallographic da database, for example, for small molecules, look if some of the geometries are feasible, like kind of protonation states that you would have and do that. So th that does take sort of a back and forth as well. So are you doing anything different than you would do for normal protein ligand docking? Usually the problem with docking fragments into a site, big site, small fragments that can go all over the place, right? So we sort of can subdivide the site, and we've done that before, um, where we sort of say that we take um, just a certain subsection of the site first and dock to that then dock to another site, and then sort of combine the docking list or look at them separately. So we can sort of um, 
even though we can use the same sort of electrostatic grids for the whole pocket, so we're not changing them, we can sort of identify through sphere sets where to start the docking. So we would sort of limit, let's say, we can limit to one side to another side and see um, how these compounds dock in the different subsites. And that might be based on, based on prior knowledge from co-crystal structures? From co-crystal structures. So for example, for this enzyme, we have a cofactor that goes in. So the cofactor actually sits in here, alpha keto group rate. So that would be maybe one subsite. We know that this lysine tyrosine pair is very important, second subside. And we have the actual peptide, which is the methylated lysine that we have coming in, and that comes in over here, so third subside. So yes, we are still guided by the biology. It's you know beautiful. <laughs> but yes, then, so then you can combine or look at the list separately, and that's sort of what we do. And with automated filtering, is there some way just to incorporate that into the docking code? I mean, if it's automated. So one of the people, so uh, one of our postdocs, actually, Kate, I think, is sort of trying to automate some of this. The problem comes in, and I kind of, like, when we go through some of this, so I have a list of a few molecules here, is we can automate some of these things. But I think sometimes what you need, and maybe this is where this field is great, is not just take things that we have prior knowledge to. So a lot of, most of the compounds, for example, um, actually have a hydrogen, uh, like go towards this lysine tyrosine pair. Uh, the compound that we chose initially, our fragment, does not do that. Um, so would you be able to pick it up by doing these automated filters by, for example, because we do, for certain projects, we'll do distance restraints to key, towards key residues. So for example, the GPCRs, if you know <coughs> that this key residue does a specific biology, you might want to have compounds near it. So that, that is an option, but then are you limiting yourself to sometimes what you're gonna bind to the active site? So it's sort of like go back and forth and, and sort of see if that's a feasibility in the system that you're working in. Um, so, uh, so we do, so for example, like we were saying, so to narrow the list down and to go faster through it and to do some of these things, we do automated filtering. And for example, in this case, if we have known ligands, we want new chemotypes because we want new biology, as you've probably see, heard Brian talk about especially. Um, so um, then we would go and throw out any molecule that looks similar to any other known compounds that bind to the system. Um, if we do find them in top ranking list, it's sort of like a hooray for us again. Um, we kind of feel confident that we are doing something good because we are finding known compounds, but we don't want to buy or take an analog of something that's already known. Um, we can do, uh, so like you said, distances, novelty, and we actually do clustering of, um, of the docking list itself. So when we look at it, even so if we look at the one top 0.5 or 1% of the list, we want to um, cluster it beforehand so that you can look at similar compounds at the same time. And that kind of gives us information both in like, can de depending on like a small change, can the com compound switch over? Is it better binder one side over the other? So it's nice to see them all together. So even from here, so if you do some of these filtering, we can go down very quickly to about 1,000 compounds, which is much more feasible for a postdoc or a graduate student to look through. Um, so here was, are just examples on the left-hand side of what we would look for. So you have, for example, this lysine tyrosine pair and a chelation to the metal. Um, like Byron said, some little nuances in the score. We could, for example, flip this compound. So which would be the better one? So you have to sort of make that decision sometimes yourself. And you go to hit picking parties, which we have in the lab. And you try to convince your peers and colleagues that this is the best compound and this compound will get scored um, depending on how good of a job you do. And so here, for example, would be a compound that probably wouldn't pass our hit picking party. It's putting a hydrophobic group near a hydrophilic part where we know a serine binds from the peptide. So maybe that's not a good mimic. So maybe this compound would be thrown out. So you have to give your case and then, you know, people say yay or nay. And so we go through a lot of these compounds. And this is sort of what we did. And we narrowed our top 0.5% of the docking list to um, just above 14 compounds, but 14 compounds were purchasable. And this is what we see here. And you could say, yay, we have now uh, inhibitors for our, um, for our enzyme, but that's not where the story ends. And I think this is where we always have a great collaborator, um, biologists, biochemists, chemists, you know, 
um, that can help us with sort of tra trying to see now which of these compounds are real compounds. So in this case, we c there is an assay which we can do. We uh, are collaborators in the Nitsa Fujimori's lab, and especially Dan Lee, who was the graduate student on this project, was able to buy an assay where you look at demethylation of this lysine by KDMC. And when you have the demethylation, there is an antibody that can bind, and we can see 100% activity if this enzyme goes quickly through. And this would be what we would see if none of these compounds worked. For, but in our case, yay, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you a story, um, is some of these compounds worked, and so depending, some were better or other at inhibiting, depending on which concentration you see here uh, in this, from this uh, set list. And here are the, the, the um, IC50 values. So our best compound was atrine micromolar. It's not the greatest, but it's a starting point, especially since we're looking at fragments. And what we would think is sort of the end of our uh, um, list would be this compound, compound number seven, which we saw sort of where we were flipped through the slides, which had uh, an inhibition constant of, 50 uh, of 176. So again, um, these weren't great inhibitors, um, but what we did sort of think, so and anyway, so we do have um, IC50 values for all the compounds actually, but some of these, once they get to these numbers are sort of irrelevant because we can sort of get a value, value but it doesn't mean much because there's so much noise. So um, we went back actually after we get these results usually and we look at our uh, hits, like picks that we did and can we sort of infer certain things about it? And because these were actually coming from different uh, hit picking, we actually kind of picked certain compounds that looked very similar to each other. So they had the salicylate core, even though they were quite different in the top, um, and they all inhibited our enzyme. Some better than others. But, and since we had a collaboration with, uh, with uh, a chemist, we asked them, can you give us a uh, synthesis method, like an easy synthesis method, that we could expand our library. Can we do in silico sort of chemistry that you can guys can do? And this is what they came up with. It's super easy for them, I was told. And so they were able to give us this, and we expanded our libraries. And this is going to be a mess, but you can see that we can get quite a lot of molecules. And where this power is going back and forth between us is now, they, now that they, ha they could make a lot of these molecules, but that would take a lot of time and a lot of effort for a lot of graduate students. So we can dock these compounds back again and give them, again, a ranked list, looking at some certain interactions that we're uh, looking for, are molecules binding better or worse, as sort of having uh, in that respect. So we gave them our list, and uh, they made about 25 compounds that were soluble and could be uh, used to, um, to do assays with. And these were the three that had the best IC50 values. Um, we tried, if we got this compound maybe in the second round, and we tried to optimize it, but we kind of hit a wall. So as I said, we actually, um, we actually were trying to um, look at docking results from that list that they gave us of compounds which they can actually physically make. And so we look, when I look back at it, we could see that a lot of this list of compounds bound like we expected them to in our uh, docking list, but a few kind of flipped with having the carboxylic acid go into the tyrosine lysine pair. So what we saw is maybe an opportunity of trying to link the two systems based on, this, on the rings, so keeping probably one or two of these rings trying to get the carboxylic acid to uh, bind with the tyrosine lysine pair and keep the bidentane um, chelation of the metal. And this is sort of that the chemotype that we came up with. Um, well, the core chemotype, but there's different ones that we generated. We docked them back again and came up with three scaffolds which we thought would bind well or would pose quite well in our active, in our active site in the enzyme. So now we've extended this and so this core here I'm showing on the right, um, and it's, you can see that it still put, makes the same sort of, um, sort of this, what the salicylate compound made, sort of similar interactions going here in the back uh, towards this um, little nice pocket, plus it makes the interactions that some of the other compounds that flipped over made. And we chose this compound basically because, again, the chemist could have a synthesis route for this. 
And so basically we could ch test our hypothesis. So we had three scaffolds, but this is the hypothesis we could test. Could we actually link certain fragments together and get better, better um, IC50 values? And um, in this case, we were able to do that. And so basically what we see here is the initial two compounds, solicitate compounds that we um, came from our docking screen, just from the docking screen with their IC50 values. And now these two compounds merged with this uh, core that can interact with the tyrosine lysine pair. And we see quite a significant about 75 to 700 um, improved IC50 values. So seemed pretty nice. Um, but did we really do what we wanted to do? In, in the beginning, we wanted to look for fragments that were selective. When we tested our fragments, um, they did not, were not within, we, uh, we switched assays. This is the Malditoff assay. And they weren't sensitive enough to actually give us answers. But these core, uh, you know, larger compounds, were able, we were able to actually screen against um, all the blue enzymes and FIH as well. And we do see selectivity against certain of these demethylases, um, which is interesting. So basically, if we take off the core that came from the salicylate and just use this uh, small compound, we see that both this compound has activity against the furthest member in the family. So this is not a good thing. But keeping what came from docking, like these larger sort of substitutions, actually shows us that we do get selectivity. So we have full, full activity for this enzyme, but it inhibits the enzyme of choice. So this is sort of showing us that we can get maybe sort of new chemotypes or new subtypes, uh, cores that would be specific for the enzymes. And here we show sort of the specificity of um, our compound over the different enzymes in here. We do well, I would say maybe against FIH, KDM2A, KDM6. And these are demethylases, for example, like these two that just go for different um, spots or different uh, genes. Um, but we don't do much well against closer related enzymes, such so as the KDM5s. But um, we don't, didn't stop there. Uh, we still try to optimize the compound. So we went back again to docking. Can we now make better compounds? And this is usually probably what you would have seen in Brian's talk. You know, we screened a whole fragment library and then we got a compound. <laughs> uh, which had an IC50 value of... Uh, uh, there was a lot of coffee drunk in <laughs> <laughs> But so this is sort of what we do. We try to sort of collaborate very closely with uh, biologists and um, the GPCR world, especially like we had a talk today from Ryan, um, to kind of get these sort of back and forth um, ideas back, uh, and um, trying to sort of uh, a good conversation between us. And... Um, in the end, I think a lot of the projects especially, uh, we try to see how well we do uh, in, the, in actually getting the correct pose for our compounds. And we were lucky to actually collaborate also with Udo Opperman's group on this project. And here we see, it not, we couldn't get the, unfortunately, the salicylate fragments, uh, crystal structures of those, but we were able to get the core compounds too. And here we see for those crystallographers or X crystallographers in the, in the, in the uh, audience, uh, two FOF, uh, this is an omit map at 2.5 sigma showing um, where the ligand would be. And here we have the superposition of the actual crystal structure on the right, the salicylate compound on the, on, in the middle, and on the left, the hybrid core compound. So not bad for docking, <laughs> especially if, you ca if you know, you're trying to convince biologists to use it. This is sort of a very good, um, you know, example of, of getting it, I would say, pretty right. And so basically, hopefully, I showed you a little bit more of like what our day-to-day -day life looks like um, and how much sort of um, input we actually put into um, going from a hit-picking list of optimizing, you know, even our enzymes. Um, sometimes we're not as lucky to have a lot of compounds, but, um, you know, we try to do our best to optimize our sites and how we get finally from a know ranked list of maybe a thousand or now I kind of I think skipped a slide where um, what I wanted to like you know what Brian was sort of uh, alluding to our libraries are getting much larger um, and so the problem is becoming I don't know what went but um, of looking through compounds much bigger um, so you know like I said I initially looked we docked 600 fragments but if we were doing it today we would be docking about 8.5 million fragments. 
So that is a much harder job. So if you do your math really quickly, I would have to look at least through 40,000 uh, compounds. And even I don't think I can do really, really do that. Um, so um, we really need to uh, find methods, and this is sort of one of the another part of our lab's development is how do you look at this list? How can you cut it down? How can you, um, you know, look for this, for this project might be a little bit easier because we have high throughput data. So if we're looking for subtype specificity, we can actually use and do uh, counter. Um, so um, Penamoto sort of um, uh, discard, discard certain uh, um, compounds by doing automated filtering based on high throughput screening. But yes, so we need more methods and maybe you guys can help us on how to do that. And in the end, I'd like to thank um, Brian uh, for teaching me everything I know about docking because I came from the crystallography world. Um, I, and Elizabeth, who started this project, it was another postdoc in our lab, as well as the group of Danica Fujimori, who does a lot of the chemistry and biology on this project, and Udo Opperman's group, um, who both do the crystallography and the counter screening with uh, the Multitoff. Um, so that's it. I have a question. With the final compound that you got, if there was some library that contained it, say all synthesizable compounds off of the base in, in Kemble, or in the Hensing, um, how well would it score? Um, we actually never tested that because we were looking at with internal lists and comparing to the salicylates, but we haven't rerun the docking screens against and seeing how those compounds do and if we would drown out the signal. Uh, the hope is because we are doing putting it at the top of our rank list, which is in the top 5%, even if we expand the library, we still would hopefully find it in the top ranking list. So it's sort of like you just, yeah. Okay, open up to other questions. Have you guys made any effort to quantify how helpful the hit picking parties are? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's sort of, I think we're trying to do that uh, recently. Um, we've, um, we keep kind of scores of, you know, which comp, we, we sort of do, but then we don't. Who doesn't get invited back because they pick the best Yes. Um, so we, because we pick what we think are actives, um, uh, we can sort of see who can, you know, out of the pick compounds, who has the best, best hit rate. But who doesn't pick the right compound and we don't test those compounds? I guess we don't have that data. Um, and sort of, I don't know, it's sort of, or is it part of the question I think you're asking. I was just wondering what kind of enrichment you get there, because if that's the part that you can't do on a larger scale, how much of a price do you have to pay? How good does the replacement, the automa automated method have to be to match that? Um, I think, especially in our lab, it would be really, have to be really good because um, we do have a discussion for each compound. So even if the, everybody gives a score, we have a discussion. And since in Brian's lab, we come from such, so many various sort of fields uh, and backgrounds. So we have chemists, we have crystallographers, we have biologists. We all have different inputs. And I think that sort of will be hard to bottle. But I think certain parts of that can be. Um, definitely done, but I'm not sure if, even when you get to that point and you can encode some of this stuff, I don't know if it won't be still um, sort of beneficial to still go through that list. It'll just be a much shorter list and much more refined list. I, I don't know what degree you keep notes about things, but that would be very interesting to learn. Yeah, we so we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, is it, is it uh, you can share yeah, absolutely. And, and I just, just just to add with, with Serotonin 2A, which is an ongoing project, uh, we're collaborating with Google on it's one of the big large scale libraries and they hate mm -hmm. this whole process. Yeah. I bet everybody in this room does. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they, it, what we're doing there is we're um, we're we're picking um, we're we're testing all the molecules, including the ones we didn't like in the hit picking party. And we're um, also testing, just going through the list, you know, clustered and going, you know, the top N and testing those. Have you, have you tested the copy? Yeah, tested the copy. Some people say beer would be appreciated. Yeah. Is the part that they hate is the fact that you're using human brains? <laughs> what, what, what is what is it that Google doesn't like? That you're using human brains for scoring? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that it doesn't scale and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you can't bring me to your lab every day, and, or someone else, or, you know, a chemist from our lab. <laughs> yes? Uh, we, we 
really nice talk. I, I think you know your picking party is something that us uh, modelers do in, in real life in industry anyway, right? So if you have a hit from high to screening, you want to know the binding mode, you would generate multiple binding modes and then you would use your expertise to, 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 to decide which binding mode looks the most reasonable. Mm -hmm. And you might look at the CSC, look at confirmations, you might want quantum mechanic calculations yes. to, to, to look at gram state confirmations and, and pick the one that you like the most. You know, for that, you might be doing it for one or two compounds. We do it for yeah, a doing it for a hundred or four hundred or a thousand. We're doing it for thousands sometimes. Like I say, when we start with our list before the automated, especially before the automated um, hit pick, like uh, filtering, um, I will look at five thousand. Like my list will start with five thousand compounds. Uh, so we are looking at much more. Even when we bring the compounds to the hit picking list, we've gone from let's say five thousand ranked compounds, and then you know do, like I said, automated filtering based on known compounds, not because we're looking for subtype specificity to all other also enzymes. Um, we can really sort of decrease the number of compounds, but then we still bring about 50 compounds only from that top list to our hit picking party. So you're already seeing a filter before others see your compounds. And so you're, you're doing this because you're the best scoring function. Yes. There isn't a scoring function that's automated that's good enough to help you decide Exactly. And I mean, these patterns, like I saw, showed you, like, you know, we I found a pattern where, you know, once in a while, depending if the cap, there was a cap on the, on, on, the, on the oxygen, on the hydroxyl, you would have a flip of a molecule that you can't see unless you actually go through the molecules and like one by one and sort of see these patterns and, and sort of develop an eye for that. Uh, perhaps you mentioned this and I missed it. Uh, so in linking these fragments <coughs> together, do you... How do you optimize the linkages? Like, certain atoms can be so far apart in space, you can include many carbons between them, maybe add double bonds to restrict space. But so basically, uh, so yes, how did we design the linking of the fragments? So basically what we did for the in this case was to use the two different like if we had the two different fragments docked into the site, we tried to link them based on how they were actually placed. And we were lucky that there was, for a lot of them, there was just a single bond, or we can do two rings and then sort of link to it. So we tried to use information that we already had from the docking and try to link them that way. Um, and then sort of redock these compounds. And then based on that docking, if we still got the bidentane sort of a coordination to the metal and to the tyrosine lysine pair that we wanted, those were the sort of our top ranking list again. And then we went, like I said, we went back to the chemist and said, which one can you make? <laughs> So given the topic of this meeting, one thought would be to take your thousand hand animated good and bad docking, mm -hmm. train a neural network on the 3D convolutional, you know, convolutional neural network on the poses, and then one advantage of that would be that you have positive and negative examples. So right now you're doing your hand annotation to get rid of the false positive. Yes. Then you could take that function and run it through the whole set of 800 million compounds that were below your 1% mm -hmm. cutoff and try to rescue the false negatives. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's, I and think, why... somebody do that. Yes, and that's, I think, why we sort of wanted to show you, like, what we do by hand if, you know, especially if you're in the field. I think, you know, most people are just not aware of how much input goes in every day into some of these, um, you know, docking lists and picking we wrote a hits. program to do that with uh, handmade features called mm. Magnet, and we found that we could bring lots of things from the huge unlooked at list up. Uh, back up to the top. Mm. That was actually kind of more productive than the eliminating the false positives. positives. We had lots of assay capacity. Needed. Yeah, and the system is great for that also because like we can get such finesse and later on in the activities, so we can really see um, which compounds are good or bad and get always an IC50 value almost. Okay, we'll see you